Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. It's uh, great to be back here with you again this evening. It's been a while, and I, I always appreciate uh, coming and, and being with you. And uh, of course, appreciate your support. And uh, I know each time I've been here, I've promised you about our next publication, but it's definitely on the way. We, uh, we, we are definitely now expecting to be out in November. And of course, each time I talk with you, the book gets larger. <laughs> At last count, Brother Sababu, my co-partner there, told me we were around about 800 pages. So we're going to try to split it up for you, maybe four and four. Gives you some good uh, wintertime reading. But then in a way, it's when we recognize that uh, we, are a, we are as complicated as any other people. Right. And one of the things sometimes we underestimate the degree to which we must address ourselves as a people. And too often we have people who think that our issues and the things that we have to deal with can be described in 25 words or less. And that, uh, and so there are people who think that uh, we are small people and small-minded people, so uh, they don't have to write sometimes some sizable uh, material. If other nations and other people require libraries to deal with their issues, so do we. And uh, the interesting thing about the upcoming book is that with that 800 pages, it's basically a survey right. looking at various areas of life. Uh, if you recall, we, we, we titled it Blueprint for Black Power. And we are essentially then trying to lay out a blueprint, a prescriptive uh, book. Now we are coming into more and more into prescriptive type of writing, laying out very practical kinds of steps and very practical methods for achieving what it is we must achieve as African people. This means we have to cover a lot of territory. We are covering psychology, we are covering, of course, history, sociology, a great deal of political science, a great deal of uh, economic, uh, economics, and uh, related fields, anthropology and so forth, because all of these have to be combined in the process of nation building. And this is what we really have to be about, is the process of building a nation right. as a people. Right. If you're not thinking in terms of nationhood, then I must say, frankly, you're not thinking seriously of being liberated. All right, all right. Trying to integrate and merge with our enemies is not going to solve our problem. All right. And it's not going to happen, as a matter of fact. It is a fantasy that has kept us from taking care of business for far too long. The idea that we are going to one day be one with these people. <laughs> that we're going to merge into invisibility <laughs> with these white folk. And even if that were possible, we should question our motive for wanting to do so. You know, why would you want to merge with the world's greatest criminals and thieves? With the people who have the worst values the world has ever known. It amazes me sometimes how we can hear some of our parents telling our children we want to be just like them. <laughs> yeah, it's a joke. It's an insult to hear Dan Quayle or to hear uh, President Clinton come and lecture 
black folk on values. It's an how, how dare we let these people into our churches to try to lecture us on values? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing situation to try to talk to us about values. To try to talk to us about population control. <laughs> Another joke. Yeah, yeah. They're gonna, the first thing we think about when people talk about uh, population control is the overproduction of African people. You know, uh, so-called third world people. As I said, we can solve the overpopulation problem quickly if we could reduce the European population drastically. Mm -hmm. Yes, and people, are, they, of course, as I tell you, this world has to always be backwards, you see. The, the ones who need to be reduced most drastically have the world thinking the other way around. Because a good deal of the problem sometimes is not the number of people in the world, but the number of greedy people in the world. Where you have a so-called minority of people who consume the vast majority of the world's resources. This large population that they talk about could eat better if these people weren't eating everything up. And so to a good extent sometimes, to have more for everybody to eat, you have to get rid of the greedy ones. The ones who are over-consuming. Who are taking the food out of other people's mouths. You see? But here you have the people who rob you and take everything you got and then say, you don't have enough to support yourself. You know? And this is the kind of joke that we got going at here. And we're gonna come back to this issue of values. But we're going to talk a little bit about African-centered consciousness, personality, and culture as instruments of power. Because ultimately, this is what this whole struggle is about. Power. Not loving one another and all those things we hear. Power. And to a great extent, the problems that we are confronted with today as African people and African people in America flows from our powerlessness or our inappropriate use of power. Right. We've been made to even talk about it. We've been made to think that power is sinful and that to pursue it is a sinful pursuit. All right. That's right. And that it's wrong. But you cannot exist without power. Without power, there is no life. A battery without power is dead. You need power to, to act, to behave in the world, to deal with the world. And consequently then, we must interpret what we are about in terms of power. And we have the power, ladies and gentlemen. We have the possibilities. We just need to reorganize ourselves, reorganize our consciousness and our personality and our culture and see them as instruments of power and use them as instruments of power to transform our situation. So we should not look at consciousness as some abstraction. As I often tell people, the most practical thing you can have is a good theory, is a good concept to guide your behavior, to be used as an instrument to measure reality as an instrument to test reality. A good theory then organizes the world and organizes one's approach to the world. It permits one to be able to evaluate the world in terms of where one wants to go and in terms of what one wants to do. To be without theory then is to approach the world on an ad hoc basis, you know, just to meet it uh, here and there and, and, and to not approach it in a systematic form to live reactionarily, always reacting to what other people are doing, always being overwhelmed 
by events and overwhelmed by the future instead of creating events and creating the future and making the future. Right. See, when one has then a good theory and a good concept, one is able to do that. Consciousness, without human consciousness, there is no world. It is the presence of human consciousness that brings meaning into the world. Without human beings in this world, conscious human beings in this world, in effect, there would not be a world. We bring the world into being through our consciousness. And through our consciousness, we create the world we live in. Out of the totality of, of reality, our consciousness cuts out a world that befits itself. In other words, the kind of world you exist in reflects the kind of consciousness that you have. And notice if you change your, 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 your consciousness or change your values and orientation, you enter into a different world. You interact with different people. People often that you didn't even know existed in the world. Social situations that you, you, you might not have even recognized until you entered into a, a new level of consciousness. You see people, say for instance, who become addicted, say to crack or something, and now enter into a whole world and enter into a whole social system that before they became addicted, they hardly noticed. They didn't know what it was all about. And they picked up new friends and new relations, whole new ways of acting, whole new purposes in life. They lost old friends, broke with old families, and all kinds of things. In other words, the consciousness, that addictive consciousness, brought into the world a new foreground and put other things into the background. Therefore, man's consciousness is a creative act. And the kind of consciousness you have will determine the kind of world you create. All right. And consequently, when you look at the world that we live in, African people, we must recognize to a great extent it is a world of our own creation. All right. It is a world that has been generated by the type of consciousness we've been permitted to be instilled in us as a people. All right. As I told you earlier today on the radio, we talk about the white man as having power. And I want you to recognize that power ultimately has to do with a relationship between people. And that the white man's so-called power is to a great extent based upon the nature of the relationship he has with the black man. We empower him by the nature of our own behavior and attitudes as a people. He cannot be, as I said earlier, what he is unless we are what we are. All right. I'm telling you. <laughs> to a good extent, to a good extent, the European is our creation. Mm. All right. Yes. Mm-hmm. If we look at our behavior, we will see that to a good extent it is our behavior, our values, our consciousness, the kind of personalities we've established in ourselves, our tastes, our desires and needs that maintains the European in this position. Mm. All right. We talk about the civil rights movement and the apartheid system of the South. When blacks decided just to get out of the buses and walk, the system changed. Right. Yeah. When they just stopped sitting behind the white driver, just changing that relationship right. changed the nature of power right. in that system. When they decided then to walk side by side, when they decided to walk abreast and line themselves up, because they had not walked that way before, for the, the ends before, the relationship changed. When they kept their monies in their pockets, when they sat on those stools and blocked the other people from them, and changed the nature of the interactions between themselves and Europeans, the nature of the system changed. 
So therefore, we have tremendous power. It depends upon how we align ourselves as a people and how we decide to relate to other people in the world because they cannot have what they have unless we are who we are. And that is why we don't have to spend a great deal of time always appealing to them and analyzing them because we can better appeal to our own sense of self and our own consciousness. And we waste a lot of time trying to transform them when through transforming ourselves, they will be transformed automatically. <laughs> the power is in our hands. We are not destined to be the servants of white folk. That is not the destiny of black folk. No way. And we, and we have to change this idea because many of us are still operating on that concept. As I said this morning, many of us go to these schools to become what? Qualified. To work for whom? For them. Why do we assume that they're going to have the jobs for us? Yes. These people are having difficulty making jobs for themselves. The greatest problems that the Europeans are facing today and the European economies are facing today is that they are not generating enough jobs for their own people. And even though America is bragging about the millions of jobs it's creating, those jobs are part-time jobs. The bulk of them are part-time jobs, low-wage jobs, and jobs that have little or no future. So when people talk about creating jobs, you got to ask what kind of jobs are being created. That is why, of course, this system is not investing in black education. It no longer needs black people to maintain its employment structure. You see it bringing in people from outside of the nation to be employed. You see, it even is hiring in the world itself, in other nations and other places. Already, it has reached the point where its need for black males is pretty much saturated. And it literally then is warehousing us in the jails and prisons and provoking us to kill each other and to destroy each other out here in these streets. And yet, we are still organizing the education of our children as if the white man still has jobs waiting for them in multitudes. How different our education would be if we sent our children to school to create jobs for themselves. Right. To create their own economic and political systems. To see themselves as the major sources of their employment. As I remarked earlier today while we were in the radio station, I heard something about some people out here uh, protesting for jobs and uh, pushing these other people for jobs. And I asked the question, do we know how many jobs we really create for other people? Right. We are a job creating people. We don't realize it because we don't think in terms of nation. You see, we saw ourselves as a nation, we could see that we create jobs like any other nation. All right. I mentioned that today. How many jobs are created by black music? All right. Yeah, look at the whole structure of the music industry. From promoters to, to manufacturers of the records and the tapes and what have you, to the whole entertainment field, to the sellers of, of music in the stores, you know what we say, the Tower Records and the other uh, great uh, sellers of records and music and so forth, advertising that uses our music and all these things. How many thousands of jobs are we creating as people? We're creating them, but they have them. You see? 
We sing the music, they sell it. We sing the music, they market it. We sing the music, they promote it, you see. We sing the music, they produce great uh, conglomerates like Sony, CBS Music, creating all kinds of jobs. We're creating tremendous jobs for a lot of people. How many jobs do we create just buying from Koreans? Buying from other ethnic groups out here. How many people are we creating employment for in terms of our spending habits as a people and our consumption habits as a people? How many jobs are we creating going to jail? We're creating all kinds of jobs and wealth. And we must come to understand this. We are creating these jobs and yet we are begging for jobs. This means in somewhere our consciousness has been impaired. We're begging for what we are making already. And we cannot use our own creations as a source of our own wealth. I told you earlier today that the Creator could not have intended for us as African people to be a poor people if the Creator implanted in our soils all the wealth all right. that was planted there. All right. We talk about the minerals and the oil and the gold and the this and the that that's implanted in African soil, so it seems as if the Creator blessed us from the very beginning with wealth and possibility. Therefore, for us to be going hungry over this wealth and to be starving in the midst of it and to be perceived as a dependent, indebted people while our wealth is being shipped out to other people, we are actually selling a lot of it for pennies and nickels and dimes and less means that there is something wrong with our consciousness. Because ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, we've said what? That the wealth of a people is ultimately not in their land. But where is it? It's in the mind. All right. The wealth of man is in his mind, right. in his consciousness. You gotta look at it. And we mentioned the example of Japan no mineral wealth to speak of whatsoever. Nothing at all. A nation, by the way, which is totally dependent. Of course, we get, them, we get things backwards, don't we? We see ourselves as depending on Europeans when the reality is the other way around. When they depend on us and our souls and our people, we have to be backwards in order for this situation to be the way it is. Our reality has to be turned backwards and we have to live in an almost permanent state of deception in order to be used the way we are used. The Japanese must depend on others for their vital resources, their oil, their timber, all of these things that they use to create their technology and so forth is taken from the soils of other people and then sold back to them. And yet they are seen as rich and powerful. And the peoples whose wealth they take or buy are seen as poor and poverty stricken. Ultimately then, you cannot rob or take from wealth from a what? Poor people. You cannot get wealth from a poverty stricken people. People who have nothing, you can get nothing from. So if you're getting all your diamonds and your gold and your magnesium and all this other stuff, then from African people, then African people must be what? Wealthy and rich. And therefore, if African people are poverty stricken with this material wealth, then it must be because our consciousness as a people is impoverished. And we are suffering then an impoverishment of our mentality. As we said before, if you have a good mind, you can con another joker out of his land. You can con him out of his diamonds and his gold. 
And this is what the other people have done. They have used their mind and their cleverness and taken from us what they did not have originally. And therefore, consciousness is not an abstract concept. It is not a theoretical concept. It is a concept that is directly related to the reality one lives in and to the reality that one experiences. It is directly related to the type of life that one will live and does live. So I'm going to look at this for a minute. Particularly the consciousness of Africans in America. I'm often somewhat amused and taken aback by the number of people in this society who claim that slavery occurred somewhere back there. That, and you got some so-called black conservatives who claim that slavery no longer influences the nature of African people. I wonder what those people have to conserve in the first place. <laughs> Are they conserving power? They're conserving wealth? What does a black conservative conserve? You know, you have to conserve something. And since they have very little, if anything, they must only be conserving the system that has created their poverty to begin with. And you see them ultimately justifying the poverty of African people and justifying the political and social and economic subordination of African people in the name of some kind of higher principles. So slavery is not supposed, the experience of slavery is not supposed to be operating in the mentality of black folk. And you hear a lot of our youngsters will say that as well. How do you talk about slavery? That was back there. Or you know, white start to that. Well, you know, that was back there. We don't have anything to do with that anymore. You see. And it's an amazing situation because you have to remind them that you're still a living off the interest of the wealth that your forefathers earned from slavery. You are still enjoying the accumulated wealth that began with the enslavement of our people. And if you're, you're going to enjoy the wealth that was generated by evil, then you must take the curse that comes along with it. And therefore, even though you personally had nothing to do with it, but because you have received stolen goods, you must pay the price as well. And because you fight and struggle to protect those stolen goods, and you defend them, and you organize your society and your relationship to my people to maintain them and to continue to enhance them, then you must pay the price. That's why you live in terror. That's why you are stabbed in these streets. That's why you're going to suffer, no matter how good you are. No matter how liberal you are. Mm -mm. Ladies and gentlemen, when we behave as adults, we must recognize that our behavior will be visited upon our children. And that our children pay for our misbehavior. As we say, an act does not end at the point of its occurrence. Right. It continues to reverberate into the future right. and down across the generations. Right. And that's why when you behave in a particular way, you have to think in terms of seven generations from your behavior as to how what you're going to do is going to affect those generations later on. And even though those children may appear to be so-called innocent, they will still pay the price of your own misbehavior. This country whose parents and whose adults have misspent its treasure and uh, 
And while they have enjoyed that treasure, ultimately their children will have to pay the taxes or will have to pay the price. So we have a bunch of people out here who think they can rape and rob the world and think that they could have enslaved the world and, and think then that they are going to sleep well at night. It doesn't work that way. So we have some of our people here who think then that slavery was back then and had nothing to do. and had nothing to do with them. Ladies and gentlemen, we've never escaped slavery. We still share the slave consciousness of our great-great-grandparents. We are of the same mind to a great extent that they were. We have not advanced beyond these people. How can I say that? I generally ask a series of questions. You say that you, that slavery has nothing to do with you and slavery was back there. And I ask you the question then, what language do you speak? Mm -hmm. When did you learn that language? Was that the language African people were speaking when we were taken into slavery in America? In other words, the language we speak, the language we speak at this moment is what? A slave language. The language that our slave ancestors were forced to learn. And we still speak it and you can still hear the pigeon, the Creole, and the other kinds of stuff in our language right at this moment that they had to go through. That language with its words defined by history and by an experience is the language we use today to guide our behavior. It's the language we use today to talk to ourselves. It's the language we use today to learn about ourselves and to learn about the world. It's the language today we use to try to understand ourselves. Is there no wonder then that we are still confused? So we have not escaped slavery because we are still using a slave language and we speak the language of slaves. What kind of food do you eat? You say soul food? Was that the food of African people? Slave food. The food that we find most satisfying, the food that we find that sticks to our ribs, the food that we call down home, a food that we learn to eat in the quarters. And yet we dare say that we have escaped slavery, that we have nothing to do with those people back there, that that was back there. When our whole very social life and social relationships, our very definition of ourselves as a people, our very attempt to commune with ourselves is mediated by the food of slaves. Understand what I'm trying to get at? All right. And how can you say that you exist in a different consciousness from another people? What kind of uniforms are we wearing? Huh? What kind of clothes are we wearing? Were these the clothes of African people? Huh? This is what we got to look at. Yes. What is this to say then that we've escaped slavery? All right. What kind of names do we respond to? All right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tamikas and all these other things we got going out here. What kind of names do we identify with? Why is it that African names sound strange to us now as a people, and yet we dare say that we have a different consciousness from our great slave grandparents? How can we say that? We are still of the same consciousness, and we are still in the same position because we are still servants 
of the white man. And our reason for being in America is to serve white folk and to generate wealth for them. And there has been no change at all in terms of our relationship to these people. The values that we pursue are slave values and the values of servants. The social relations that we create and interact with were built and developed during the periods of slavery. We have not escaped it at all. But it is time for us to change the slave consciousness, this consciousness of servitude that is still too much with us today. And ultimately, we ask the question that's closest to home for a lot of people. When we claim that we've escaped slavery, and the slavery was something back there, which has nothing to do with us today, and then I ask you the question, what kind of God do you worship? <laughs> name of it? Who taught you to praise him? Was this the God you were praying to before you were brought to these shores? Was this the religion you had before you were brought to these shores? Can you name one African God? How can you then, who define yourself, the very essence of yourself and the very essence of your soul, and organize the very nature of your life here on earth based on a God handed to us by our slave masters claim that you have no slave consciousness and are not related to slavery. In other words then, ladies and gentlemen, we are not Africans. We are possessed by spirits and demons. We have let another people's spirit take possession of our bodies and take possession of our minds. When we speak, it is not with our African voice. It is with the voice of that demonic presence that uses our lips to speak its own language. Yes. Yes, and we have to recognize this. We are possessed. And if we are to transform ourselves and to transform that the nature of our relationship with those who are our masters, we must engage in an exorcism and clear the devils out of our minds. And at this time, then, it'll pay you to, to read a little bit about demonic possession. And you have to be demonically, we have to be demonically possessed. Because if we talk about black on black violence, self-defeating behavior, self-destructive behavior, then we could not be possessed by a beautiful and wonderful God we must be possessed by a demon. It's interesting to look at the literature on possession. We have uh, several, uh, a couple of types of possession. One is called a somnambulistic possession. Somnambulistic. Soma, in this instance, having to do with uh, sleep. You hear it in the word somnex. You know, ambulistic to move around, ambulatory, right? So we are talking about people who are what? Sleepwalking. Not a, you know, they're not awake, but they're walking around. The body is moving and it is walking in an organized fashion and walking systematically, but the person is still asleep. And in somnambulistic uh, possession then, the individual's original self has been repressed and displaced 
and the spirit, and he identifies with the spirit that possesses him. And his eye and the spirit's eye are one and the same. We have a lot of that here today. Where the spirit that has been implanted in us, we have taken to be us, and we've identified with it. That is why in, in defending ourselves, we end up defending the people who rule over us. In defending our ego, we end up maintaining the social structure that has destroyed our ego to begin with. And you see it in our youngsters who will fight and kill in the name of respect and fight because their egotistic uh, orientation has been insulted. And therefore, in defending their ego, they do not kill the people who destroyed their ego. They kill each other. And maintain the ones who destroyed them in the first place in power. And that's why the subtitle of my book, Black on Black Violence, was Black Self-Annihilation in Service of White Domination. We are killing each other in order to maintain this system. We have let ourselves become possessed by a spirit such that when we become aggressive, we aggress against the self instead of those who are the source of our aggressive orientation. We talk a lot as a people about self-hatred. Self-hatred is a personality configuration. It is a form of personality organization. It is an orientation toward the world and toward oneself. Self-hatred, then, is the white man's greatest protection against being destroyed by the black man. To a good extent, self-hatred is the white man's defense mechanism, is the white man's form of self-defense. How can we say that? Right. To a great extent, one function of the personality is to direct energy, to direct aggression, to channel aggression and energy and wishes and impulses in particular directions, to organize feelings, to organize energy, to achieve certain ends. Those things that we hate, often then when we are angry or hostile, we aggress against them, don't we? We attack them often. We destroy them. Then we have a problem, don't we? If we attack the things we hate, if we attack the things toward which we hold hostility, when we are overly frustrated and when we are angry, then what happens if that thing we hate is ourselves? It means then, ladies and gentlemen, that when we become frustrated and angered as a people, when we are overwrought by feelings of hostility, and our self-hating personality seeks to channel that hostility and channel that aggression, it's gonna channel the aggression right back on to the self because that's the thing we hate most. So consequently, black anger then becomes a conduit for black self-destruction, for black self-defeat. The object of our hostile, aggressive feelings becomes ourselves. And you can see then how the white man is protected by that personality structure, right? While he stokes our anger, while he stokes our hostility, while he stokes our frustration, and while we get mad and we want to strike out, when we decide to strike out and aggress, we strike out and aggress against the self. 
And by doing so, he is left untouched and unscathed. And therefore, our self-hatred becomes his principal means of defending himself and of maintaining himself. One of the things that frightened him most about the Ferguson case was that Ferguson's self-hatred mechanism broke down. Yeah. Unlike many deaf, dumb, and blind Negroes, he knew who his enemies were. And so when he got angry and hostile, instead of going out to drink himself to death, instead of going out to smoke crack and destroy himself, instead of going out to killing someone who looked like himself, instead of going out to commit suicide, and put himself in a place to be destroyed by somebody else. He went directly to the source of his frustration. And this is what frightened those people. They were wondering how many more are there like that? And are they increasing? <laughs> Yes. So you can see why the seed of self-hatred is planted in the minds of the black man. All right. We spend a lot of time about what it does to us, but we got to look at it because I've told you before, every maladaptive characteristic in the black psyche is there for white folk. And it's not purely there because they hate you, or they misunderstand you, or they don't know who you were, what you're, uh, it has nothing to do with all of that. I tell people when you analyze the so-called aberrations in the black personality, you must always ask the question, what are their social functions and roles? Who benefits from this aberration in the black man's mind? What are the social and political and economic benefits, and for whom? Who gains from this particular orientation in our minds? And then you begin to see why it's there and what its function is. And so every complaint we have about ourselves has a political, economic, and social intent beneficial to white folk and detrimental to ourselves. And that means then, somewhere along the way, we became possessed by these orientations. And they were implanted in our personalities. We have come to identify with them as our natural selves, as our natural orientations. We have assumed that they represent who we are. And we have now then found many ingenious ways to defend the demons that possess us. And ultimately then, those demons destroy us and have us destroy others like ourselves. There's another form of possession we call lucid uh, possession. In this sense, the person at least has a sense of self and they have the sense that there's another spirit in them and they struggle with that spirit, sometimes losing the battle every now and then. They become obsessed with their struggle, with the spirit, and in a sense then are disenabled by that struggle. So some of us are in that state. We're not quite satisfied with the identity we have. We know somehow that there's a deeper African self in us. We also aware that there's a Eurocentrically implanted demon in us, and we wrestle with it daily. There's another type of possession we talk about here, and that's spontaneous. What has sort of occurred spontaneously against our will? This is in contrast 
to one we, we, we uh, talk about as artificial, one deliberately created. What do we mean by that? When we go into a particular social setting, such as a church or such as a rock concert or the like, and we go through a set of rituals and behavior, we go there and go through these behaviors and rituals and songs and dance as a mean of deliberately being possessed by what? The spirit. And having our bodies taken over and being possessed. And then we say, we feel what? The spirit. We feel the spirit living within us. And so consequently, much of our life is about provoking, through artificial means, spirits which take over us and assume control of our behavior. Latent possession means when we are possessed and we don't even know that we are possessed. And I think that defines a lot of us. We're not even aware, and those are the hardest ones to break through because they don't sense any kind of split within the personality. They and their possessing spirit are one and the same. And when you try to exorcise, exorcise their possessing spirit, they feel as if you are attacking them personally. And in defending their person, they defend the spirit that possesses them. Let's be a little more concrete, and I want to just give you an example of what I mean by this. You know, and in the literature, we talk about these spirits as what we call the incubi and the succubi. The spirit that lies in the body or lies on the body, the incubus, and the one that lies under the spirit, the succubus. When we talk about this spirit, though, that possesses us. When we talk about this spirit that the European implanted in us in terms of the language, in terms of the food, in terms of the religion, in terms of the values, in terms of the social relations, in terms of the name, we are talking about a spirit that's just not a spookish uh, entity in ourselves. It actually incarnates in us. What do we talk when we talk about incarnate? We're talking that we, we are dealing with the Latin root carnes, which has to do with what? Meat, flesh. In other words, the spirit comes to dwell in our very flesh and comes to sculpt our very bodies. And therefore, the spirit is a physical thing as much as it is a psychological thing. The bodies that we have tonight, ladies and gentlemen, are bodies that have been created by the European experience mm. and are not our natural bodies as African people. Just as the surface of our bodies reflect the influence of another people, the very internal nature and the physiology of our bodies reflect those people as well. That's why when you get rid of them, you're going to have a healing experience. And your whole body will change. I've read some of this before, but let me read it again, I think, in this context. This is most dramatic, and the things I'm talking about are most dramatic when we study the so-called multiple personality. And let me read you a description here that was printed in the Times. And those who might be familiar with it, indulge me here, because I think it, it points out to something. It begins, when Timmy drinks orange juice, he has no problem. But Timmy's just one of close to a dozen personalities who alternate control over a patient with multiple personality disorder. And if those other personalities drink orange juice, the result is a case of hives. What are we saying here? We got one body, but depending on what consciousness possesses that body, that body will react to the drinking of orange juice 
with or without hydrogen. It will break out in blisters. So if he drinks orange juice when one of the other personalities is possessing it, welts and hides will break out right there. If Timmy comes back, if the new consciousness comes back and takes over that body, the hides will disappear almost on the moment. In other words, then, there's a different body for a different consciousness. It goes on to say then that medical disorders are found to differ from one sub-personality to another. In other words, even though these so-called personalities possess the same so-called body, each personality has a different order of illnesses associated with it. Each personality is vulnerable to a particular type of ailment, one way or the other. So what are we talking about? We are saying that each consciousness, which is represented by each personality, creates its own body, creates its own physiology, and thereby creates its own vulnerability to various ailments and so forth. You see, you get people in medical school who try to teach you that disease only occurs as a result of some kind of viral syndrome or some kind of entry into the body of some bacteria, other thing, and certainly that is a part of it. And certainly there's reality there. But the body must interact with the viruses and must interact with the disease entity. And this is what we talk about when we talk about the immune system. That health is not necessarily the absence of the disease, but the capacity of the body to resist the disease, to stand up against the disease. And so consequently then, when these bodies are taken over by different personalities, these personalities apparently change the nature of the immune system of those bodies, making them vulnerable to diseases when one, when one personality is present and not so when another is present. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, then, that the nature of the consciousness which possesses us as persons will to a degree determine the illnesses to which we are vulnerable. As, pe as a person and as people. And a lot of the illnesses, physical and other diseases that we suffer then, are mediated by the nature of the consciousness that we've permitted to possess us as a people. So to a great extent, the defeat of disease, the maintaining of health, must not only be pursued in terms of discovering new drugs and these kinds of things, but must involve self-discovery and self-knowledge. It goes on to state that in people with multiple personalities, there is a strong psychological separation between each sub-personality. Each will have his own name and age. Does that strike the bell? What did we say earlier? To what names do we respond? Are they the same names to which we responded prior to slavery? Do, so in other words, as we got the new slave personality, we got what? New names. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and we were changed. To a good extent, our names were given us to designate our new consciousness and our new situation. Each will have his own name and age, and often some specific memories and abilities. In other words, each personality has its own history, has its own biography, has its own memory. And you look at Negroes when they have a certain consciousness and look at the history they remember. Look at the things that they keep in their memories and look at the histories they study and identify with. Look at them fight African history. Yes. Look at them want to identify with the history of Europeans. 
Look at the way to define themselves in terms of that history. And look at them having memories only for that history. Look at those Africans who are still under the possessive influence of the European and planted spirit and know that they have little or no knowledge of African history and therefore little or no knowledge of their own history as a person and an individual. So there's a consistency between the consciousness and the history that a person has and the memory that an individual has. They often have, they are frequently, for example, personalities differ in handwriting, artistic talent, or even in knowledge of foreign languages. Speak a different language, depending on the personality that's in there. Multiple personalities typically develop in people who were severely and repeatedly abused as children, apparently as a means to protect themselves against the pain of abuse. Does that strike another note in you? Often only one or two of the subpersonalities will be conscious of the abuse, while the others would have no memory or experience of the pain. To a great extent, the personality of the African American today has been shaped by our desires to escape the memory of the slave experience, to deny its existence. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to come in terms with it. We don't want to re-experience it psychologically. We don't want to know about it. And therefore, our lives become defined by eternal escape and avoidance of reality and of history and of a knowledge of who we are and how we came to be, who and what we are. And consequently, we cannot act upon the reality of our history, and we guide our behavior and define ourselves in terms of a fantasy as history and a misinterpretation of reality. This is what it is. Yes. How did we get this religion we talked about earlier? I talk about Star Trek, and we talk about the what? The time war that Star Trek depicts quite frequently, of how people move from one state of consciousness and one world and are suddenly flipped into a new world. They go through a warp, and suddenly, all of a sudden, everything that they used to use to guide themselves no longer counts. The language that they used to speak can no longer be understood in the new world. The values that they used to guide their behavior are no longer uh, workable. In fact, it gets them into trouble. The gods, the culture, the nature of the social relations, and all of the things that they used prior to meeting the walk no longer suffice. Now they must learn new values and new behaviors and new orientations in order to adapt themselves to the new universe that they live in. We are in that kind of position today. Think about the African in the world the African lived in prior to being brought across the oceans. Think about the gods we praised. Think about the organization of our society. Think about the languages that we spoke, the food that we ate, the dress that we wore, the music, the song, the dance, and all of those things that defined us as African people. And think how horrendous it must have been for us to be thrown into this world where there was a whole new language, a whole new social hi uh, uh, hierarchy, a whole new set of authorities, people pushing you around who you don't understand, people who are putting strange tools in your hands, people who are trying to get you to relate to them and to relate to each other in a very different kind of way from what you're used to relating to. Think about the stress and the confusion and think about the abuse. Think about the horror of that situation our parents and great-grandparents were put in. And there was somebody that said then, if you pray to this God, if you talk this way, if you dress this way, if you relate this way, you'll get a greater sense of security. Your anxiety will be reduced. You will feel good. And you'll be able to withstand the pain of your existence. 
And the God then that I'm going to hand you is one that I have created for you. And a theology that comes with it is one that I have created so that you will continue to serve me as you continue to serve it. And we come to believe in the veracity of that God and that religion. Why? Because we feel so secure when we follow it. And we feel so relieved when we follow it. And yet we wonder why, despite all of our prayers, despite all of our devotion, we still suffer the way we do. I often ask the question, why is it that the people who pray the most have the most of their children in the jails of America today? Who shout and kick over the benches and so forth are filling up the prisons and have the children killing each other and addicted out here in these streets. There must be a problem here, ladies and gentlemen. We must reorient ourselves to our religion. We must reorient ourselves to our gods because apparently we, are not, we, are not, we don't have the appropriate orientation because as that book you read says, you can tell a tree by what? The fruit it bears. And therefore, if it bears bitter fruit, or if it bears no fruit at all, the God you worship says it is but fit to be hewn down and thrown into the flame and consumed. Read your own Bible. It gives you a very practical measure as to whether the religion you're pursuing is an appropriate one. And that measure says, look at the fruit that it bears. And if then the kind of religion and the God you're pursuing ends up having your sons in the jails of America and ends up maintaining African people in slavery and servitude in their own lands and everywhere, then something is wrong in terms of how we relate to that religion and that God because the outcome is wrong and the outcome is destructive. And it's because we don't want to confront the abuse that we went through and deal with. You see, when you go through that time warp, the only way you can ultimately come to understand the new world is to understand what happened when you went through that warp that transformed what? The personality, that made the personality what it was. And I find that interesting when further over, when I read here, of what happens when the personality moves from one personality to another, when the body is possessed by one personality and, and that personality is displaced and another one comes in. It says, during the switch, there is typically a period of seconds or even minutes when heart rate, bre uh, breath rate, and other physio uh, physiological markers show a disorganization that is followed by a new pattern typical of the personality that is emerging. In other words, then, we go through a period of disorganization of, and stress, and then the personality is reorganized to fit into the new circumstances. We can't continue to pursue this, but it's interesting to look at the changes in blood pressure that each personality brings about. The other kinds of changes, uh, physical changes that are representative of the personality. So what are we saying here then? That each personality has its own name, its own history, its own memory, biography, way of speaking, language, way of thinking, way of perceiving itself, its own vulnerabilities. Each personality generates its own life space and generates its own types of social relations. Each personality has its own tastes and appetites and its own morality. So to a great extent then, if we look at the problems and issues that confront us today as African people and see those issues in terms of the consciousness, we would recognize that we must rid ourselves of the consciousness that has been implanted in us by our European masters. One other thing I want to bring about in this situation, we notice that if you engage people 
in behavior therapy and you scan their brains and look at how their brains metabolize energy, there's a relationship between the areas of the brain that are rapidly using energy and the type of mental activity a person is undergoing and the type of uh, physical behavioral activity the person is undergoing. Each personality, each type of orientation has a blueprint in the brain in terms of the various areas of the brain that are functionally relating one to the other. And it's interesting to note, for instance, if we look at something called the uh, obsessive compulsive personality, the person who cannot stop uh, repeating a particular behavior, no matter how ir irrational it may be, the person who must wash their hands every 30 minutes, even if they are not dirty, but who are compelled to the point that they wash their hands to the point of rawness because they cannot stop is this kind of person. The person who is absorbed by a particular type of image, by a particular kinds of thought or orientation that they cannot get out of their minds. This is what we were talking about. We were talking about the obsessive compulsive personality, a rigid, repetitive personality. We note then, if you scan the brains of these personalities, that certain areas in their brain are intensely active. For instance, we talk about their frontal lobes, the so-called orbital lobe of the brain, the orbital cortex of the brain, the part of the cortex that is above the eyes, the part of the cortex that concerns itself with intentionality and purpose and direction and motivation and the connection of that cortex to the, to the lower brain, to the what we call the caudate nucleus, that part of the lower brain that deals with repetitive behavior, that deals with monitoring, that deals with modulating behavior, that deals with, in its connection with the hypothalamus, and with the thalamus, with senses, with the distribution of the senses, and with organizing the senses. When we look then at the compulsive personality, we notice that these areas are intensely active and active in a way that they maintain the symptoms of that personality. It has been shown then that when these people take a drug such as Prozac, the intensity of the, and they, they respond to them in a way that their, that their symptoms are relieved, the intensity of the interaction between these three brain areas is uh, decreased or delinked. It has also been noted then that you can put these same types of people through behavior therapy. That is by changing the nature of the social relationship between the therapist and the patient, changing the nature of the rewards and punishments that the patient undergoes in an effort to change the patient's behavior, by changing the way the patient thinks about what is in their mind, thinks about the problems that they're in. And when you had, can successfully then reduce the symptoms of the compulsive uh, disorder through this social conditioning, we note too the same kinds of physiological brain changes that occurs with the intake of the drug occurs with the intake of social training. Now what are we saying then? That the, yes that too, but what we're saying ultimately then is that the nature of the consciousness and the nature of the experience of the individual physically transforms the brain and physically transforms the way the brain operates. And therefore, when we talk about consciousness, we're talking about something that is real. We're talking about something that transforms both the psyche and the body. One of the things that you note when the individual is possessed, that the facial muscles change, and that the body itself changes in a way that it literally incarnates and represents the nature of the spirit that, contain, that, it, that uh, is possessing the individual. So to a good extent, if you're in certain religions, you can tell what particular spirit is possessing the person by the very nature of the behavior that the individual is exhibiting and the very shape of their very physiological uh, body and their face. 
In other words, ladies and gentlemen, once we get the spirits of these demons that the Europeans have implanted in our bodies, our faces and our bodies themselves will be transformed. To a great extent then, a lot of the way we look and a lot of the way we have organized ourselves physically is a result of the type of consciousness that we have. To a great extent, and I will begin to wrap it up here, to a great extent, the kind of consciousness that inhabits us reflects the kind of culture that we live in, the nature of the culture that we are a part of. Recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that culture cannot exist outside of our minds and of our bodies. Culture does not exist out there. History does not exist out there. History and culture can only exist in the minds and bodies of people. If there were no people in the world, there would be no history in the world, no culture in the world. Culture does not stand outside and direct us. It is where? Inside of us, and it directs us from the inside. Culture is instilled in our bodies and in our minds. And we have to keep that in mind, because sometimes we tend to see it as something separate from ourselves. Culture indwells in us, and it inhabits our bodies. Our history dwells in us and it inhabits our bodies. We reflect our history and, the, and we reproduce our history when that history becomes a part of us and is one with us. We tend to see culture in terms of music, in terms of the kind of dance we have, in terms of the songs we sing. And that is a part of culture. But ultimately, culture is deeper than that. Culture is a way of thinking. Ultimately, culture is a conspiracy. That is, it is a means by which a group of people organize the way they think, organize the way they believe, organize the way they see the world, so as to create a consciousness by which they can cooperate in achieving certain ends. So that they can mutually aid each other and gain ends that they cannot gain as separate individuals. So culture is an instrument of power. The individual through culture extends his power and the culture extends the power of the group. When we talk about music and song and dance, what we are talking about here then is how culture ultimately comes to be implanted in our bodies. You see, we tend to look at, at song and dance and music as entertainment. And this is our serious mistake. We have a lot of our youth out there looking at music as mere entertainment. When we say that we are being enculturated, enculturated, it means that a spirit is being implanted in us by the culture. It means our group is instilling in our bodies and in our minds a possessing spirit such that when our culture calls our name, we respond to it. When our culture is, is in need of defense and support, we then defend it and support it because we are at one with it. In other words, why does the black man respond to the white man? Why does the black man serve the white man? Why does everything the black man do benefit the white man? Why does the black man say freedom is doing what I want to do? 
And why is it that everything he wants to do enriches the European? Why is it that our youth say that they are being free and that they're doing what they want to do and they're expressing themselves and it involves buying a hundred dollar pair of sneakers from white folk? Yes. Yes. All of this kind of stuff. Why? Because the spirit that is implanted in the human mind and in the human psyche is there to only respond to its creator and to its master. And therefore, when you let another people generate a spirit in you, when you let another people generate certain values in you, when you let another people generate a certain look, in, uh, generate a certain reality for you, when you let another people let you see yourself in a particular sort of way and see your own people in a particular sort of way, they have implanted a spirit and that spirit has been created by them and that spirit only responds to them. And it only responds to them in terms of furthering their interests and working against the interests of the body it possesses. And this is why there's that self-destructive spirit in us. Because the demon that possesses a body is not there for that body. It is there for the creator that placed it there. And if necessary to obey its creator, it destroys that body. It will destroy the body it inhabits. The taste that that spirit has will be taste that can only be satisfied by buying from its master creator. The values that that spirit wishes to, to satisfy and realize can only be realized by going through the ages of the master that created it. That is why every value and every taste and every desire and every need that provokes us, every one of these things that we seek to desire ends up having us going through white folk. And that's why we think we need them. And every time we satisfy them, they in some way benefit in our seeking satisfaction because of their demon that we call ourselves is answering to the call of, uh, of its master. So a culture creates its own possessing spirits and enculturates and inculcates those spirits into the bodies of its members so that those members in defending their own egos, in defending their own interests, in defending what they perceive as their own needs, in satisfying their own taste, in satisfying their own values, satisfy the needs of the culture, enrich the culture, empower the culture, defend the culture, advance the interests of the culture. And how then does the culture implant its spirit into its members? It does it in a very strong and primordial way. It uses vehicles. And one of the major vehicles that's used is music, rhythm, song, dance. A culture involves people moving what? Together, in tandem, in rhythm. It involves them having the same temporal sense, the same kind of time clock, so that they can move in synchrony one with the other. And music is about synchrony. Poetry is about synchrony. Song is about synchrony. Music is about symbols. And you see, ultimately, it is through symbols that you evoke behavior from people. So when a culture creates symbols, those symbols are designed to evoke particular types of reactions and feelings and moods in its members. And a culture establishes the potency of those symbols through ritual, through song, and through dance. And one of the best ways then to inculcate cultural values 
A cultural spirit is through entertainment. It's while the members are being entertained, while they are feeling good, the song is carrying the cultural values into the mind and into the body. The lyrics that represent the cultural interest, the lyrics that represent cultural values are being carried on the vehicle of the music, carried through the vehicle of the poetry. The togetherness, the cooperativeness, the mutual movement together and the synchrony of the culture is being entrained through the music and through the rhythm of the dance. Therefore, you see, when you let another over your music, when you let another people take over your dance and attach their content to it, they will use your own music and your own dance and your own rap lyrics and your own poetry and your own cultural symbols to carry their message into your body and into your mind such that you can only respond then to their beck and call, and to their wishes. And you see them. Yes. You see then that they get you to buy those sneakers, and they get you to buy all of those things by what? Associating them with your what? Your music, with your cultural symbols, you see, with your poetry, with your rhythms, and so they attach their content to our rhythm, their content to our song. Yes. But in a way, they take our own instruments and turn them against the self. Notice how quickly, when one of our youngsters was rhyming to kill the police, the con that kind of content was washed right out immediately. Yes, but what washout occurs when they sing about shooting each other with their glocks and the other things? When their contents of self-destructiveness ride on the rhythm of their song and of their dance, and when the symbols are loaded then with self-destructive elements and content. So what are we saying here then? That inculturation is the process of building in responsivity and ultimately responsibility, the ability to respond to a particular call. And we then have appropriately enculturated ourselves when we can respond to our own culture and to our own values and to our own needs. One other thing here then, as we rapidly bring these things to a close. We have to look at personality in this light as well. We think our personality is ours. You must recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that the human being is a social animal. We exist in society. We exist in groups. We are born dependent not independent. We have long periods of dependency. And it is the social relationship between ourselves and our mothers and ourselves and our group that protects us during our long periods of dependency. And in a sense, we never quite get over our dependency and need for one another. And so consequently, we are social animals and we must then respond to social situations. Our personalities, because they may be our personality, does not mean that they are not inculcated with a social spirit, and they are not designed for a social end. In other words, the individual exists for the social unit, not for himself. We see individuality as something that, that, that is just for ourselves. Why are we individuals? We are individuals to a great extent because when our culture and our group confronts problems, we want to maximize the possibility that we will solve those problems 
by the fact that different individuals look at those problems in different ways and they can contribute their particular perspective to the group and those perspectives can be used as a mean for solving the problem for the group. So even individuals are there to strengthen the group. You see, if all the people in the society thought just alike and saw the world just alike, they thought no differently one from the other, the society would be soon defeated because it would be uncreative. It would, be un it would not be innovative it would not be able to change its perspective of a problem in a way so that it can solve it. So what does it do then? It creates individuals. It's like the reasons why we have genetic variations. We say no matter how uh, intense a plague may be in a nation or a people, there are always one or two people left standing. Because in some way or another, their genetic uh, structure has permitted them to withstand the plague. And as long as we got a few of those survivors left, and as long as they can reproduce, the race continues and goes on. But if the race had all exactly the same genetic structure, then a plague would wipe out the total race and the species would cease to exist. And the same thing then operates in terms of differences in personalities. We differ in personality ultimately because these differences contribute to the survival of the species. And therefore our differences are here to maintain the whole. So the main problem of a society is to maintain enough cohesion so people can act together and behave together and act in synchrony one with the other and cooperate with each other but not be too overly organized so that they cannot bring their own creative perspectives to problems and issues. You see, and this becomes the problem of society. So there must always be that tension between uh, being in the society and obeying its rules, but being a little bit off so that we can say, hey, maybe if you look at it this way, we can work it out and we can deal with it this way. So the personality itself must carry the element of society within itself. But the thing we must note, that personality, consciousness, and culture are cultural creations. And the type of culture that people exhibit and the type of consciousness we exhibit and the type of personality we exhibit reflects the type of history and experience we've undergone as people. When you let another people then be the determiner of your history and experience, they then become the determiners of your consciousness, of your personality, and of your culture. Ultimately, we must recognize that we reuse consciousness to deal with the world. Culture is an adaptative tool. It's an instrument by which we deal with reality, by which we adapt to reality, and by which we adapt reality to ourselves. The kind of consciousness we have will determine how we deal with reality. Consciousness then will, in the fact that it determines how we are going to deal with reality, how we change reality, then is a power. Because ultimately, power is about enabling something to take place. The ability to do something. The ability to change something. The ability to adapt. The ability to defend oneself. The ability to change oneself in order to solve a problem. This is what culture is about. Culture is not static. Culture is not stuck in one place. Culture itself must reconstruct itself if the system in which it exists is reconstructed and rearranged. That is why some of us get in trouble because we want to find an African culture stuck somewhere back in the 13th century and want to apply it to ourselves at this point in a different context. African culture is not a culture stuck in place and time. African culture is constantly changing and evolving because the context in which African people live changes and evolves. 
What makes it African culture is that it operates in the interest of African people. It is designed to advance African people. And therefore, the consciousness must be measured in terms of the degree to which it maintains our survival and advances our interests and puts us at the center of our concerns and at the center of our purposes. When then we talk about black culture, make sure we're not talking about a reactionary culture, a culture that has been generated by our reaction to our abuse by white folk and to our control and domination of white folk. Because it's a good part of what we call black culture that we need to exorcise from our psyches so that we can evolve a, a culture and an African-centered culture to advance our interests as a people. Another very important aspect then of consciousness is what we call values. Those things that we prefer, those things that we see as right, those things that we think we should, we should need, those things, the pursuit of which determines our behavior, organizes our minds. Con uh, values are what I call di the directional factors of consciousness. What are we talking about here? When you value something, and that value is implanted in your brain, the brain calls forth all of its resources, all of the contents that it has, the knowledge it has available to it, the behavioral skills it has available to it, the cognitive skills, the thinking skills, and things like that, that it has available to it, and organizes those things, and relates those things one to each other in such a way that the value can be achieved. When we then think about something that we value and we want to realize something that we value, we consciously or unconsciously assess our minds and say, do I have the relevant knowledge? Do I have the relevant skills? Do I have the relevant thinking and cognitive skills so that we can organize these knowledge and skills in a way that we can achieve those values? If we believe we have those skills, if we believe we have the content, if we appropriately organize those contents through thought, then we pursue those values. And chances are we may realize those values. If though we have those values and we assess ourselves, we recognize that we don't have the appropriate skills, we don't have the appropriate knowledge and content, we don't have the appropriate thought styles and so forth, we then say, well, maybe we should develop the requisite skills. Maybe we should learn the requisite knowledge. Maybe we should develop the means of thinking. And once we do this, we will then organize them away in a way to achieve our values. Once we then have values and are guided by values, and those values guide those skills and contents and so forth, we are empowered to realize those values. And therefore, values are a type of power. Where am I going with this? I'm going with this to say this. If values are a type of power, if values are the things that guide our behavior, if culture is a type of power, and consciousness is a type of power, and personality is a type of power, if we let another people determine the nature of our consciousness, our personality, and our values, they then gain power over us. If consciousness, culture, personality, and values are instruments of power, they then use our consciousness, our values, our culture as their instruments of power. How does this work out in reality? They take our cultural products, our music, our song, and use them as their instruments of power. Yes, and benefit from them. So then, what is an African-centered consciousness? An African-centered consciousness is one that is based on African-centered content, based on African-centered knowledge, based on African-centered values, based on an African-centered consciousness. To the degree 
that our consciousness is based on African-centered values and so forth, we are empowered as African people. To the degree those values and consciousness are determined by other people, we become their instruments of power and they use us against ourselves. So consequently, if we are to be empowered and if our power is to work in our interests, then our consciousness must be an African consciousness. Our values must be African values. Our personality must be an African-based personality. If not, we may suffer first ethnocide and then genocide. What are we saying? It means that our culture will not be functional in a way that it protects our interests. We must then as a people develop a new African consciousness, a, an African-centered consciousness, and that means we must develop it based on an African history, African culture, and African values. Most of all, we must develop an African sense of nationhood. Mm. All right. yeah. To a great extent, many of the problems we suffer today is a result of the fact that we do not see ourselves as a nation. And yet, we complain about how we are segregated from everybody else. We complain about how we are not a part of the mainstream, how we are not a part of the economy, how we are shut out from the government and the political process. If we are not a part of these things, and yet these things are what defines a nation, then we are not a part of the American nation. Right. That nation is a white nation. We are then, in effect, a de facto nation, but we are afraid to recognize it. If we looked at ourselves as a nation, we'd see many of the reasons why we are where we are as a people. Why? Because if we looked at ourselves as a nation, we would see why we have the problems we have. Why do we have some of the problems we have? For the same reason other African nations have the problems they have. Why? Because we permit our resources, human resources and material resources to be used by another people. We export them. We, like any other African nation, are an indebted nation. We are over indebted. When we talk about the African nation suffering from over, overburdened, uh, being overburdened by debt, we don't recognize we're talking about ourselves. When I ask here tonight, how many of us owes another black institution, another black person major debt, we would get very few hands. But if I ask how many of us in this audience tonight owed a white person, a white institution, a non-African institution, great debt, we probably all had to raise our hands. If you recognize that then, and you add this up in terms of a nation, not if you, just yourself as an individual, but if you look at all of us as individuals and in terms of a nation, you will recognize then that as a nation, we owe an enormous debt to other people. And one of the reasons why then we are poverty stricken is not because we don't have money, it's because all of our money is being used to service the debt that other nations own, that the white nation in America owns. And because we spend so much time paying our installment plans and paying our money out to these other nations of people, we cannot save our monies, we cannot accumulate our money and create wealth so that we can employ ourselves as a people, so that we can support our families as a people, so that we cannot build the schools we need to build to educate our children the way we need to educate them as a people. And consequently, we have the similar problems that all African nations have almost, where they cannot build highways, or build schools, or build hospitals, or build institutions, communication systems, and other systems, because all of the wealth that they are generating is being exported out to European nations and other nations to whom they owe debt. But you're going to see this when you look at yourself as a nation. 
And when you look at yourself as a nation, then you can see that you can change this problem by changing the debt relationship you have to other people. I was looking at an issue here the other day when we're talking about looking at African nations and we talk about the African nations as monocultures, meaning that they often exist by shipping out one or two major products, cocoa or cocoa beans or, or uh, oil or gold or something like that. And they ship these products out into what we call a buyer's market. That is, the people they sell these products to set the prices that they're going to pay for these products. So that many of these nations now are being paid less for their products than they were paid 30 years ago. And yet, the nations that buy their products and lower the prices on their products are selling them back those products in process form and selling them back their own products that have been manufactured here for higher and higher prices. And then we wonder why Africa is in debt and why Africa is impoverished. But that is the result of the fact that they are caught up in an impoverishing mechanism. But we need not talk about the continental African because we are in the same situation here today. African, the African-American nation is a monoculture. What is the commodity that we sell? Labor. We're not selling much manufacturing. We're not selling much other products. The major commodity that we have to sell was the commodity that we were bought over here for in the first place. And what was that? Labor. And now we are selling our labor in a buyer's market, meaning that the people who buy our labor are buying it at the prices they set. And they keep devaluing the price that they are willing to pay for our labor. On top of devaluing the price, they are no longer even demanding the labor. So after a while, we won't be able to sell our labor at any price. And we will then be totally deprived as a people. And therefore, we are caught in a similar position. And just as there's social disorganization in our African nations, there's social disorganization in the American nation. You cannot have your wealth flowing out of your nation. You cannot enrich other people at the expense of yourself and not have social disorganization. And that means then, if we look at ourselves as a nation, the African-American nation must do what all African nations must do. We must capture our own internal resources. We must gain control of our own internal markets. We must trade within ourselves as a people and a group and generate wealth within our own nation as a means of counterbalancing our dependence upon Europeans and upon the white nation itself. But in order to do this, we must have a nation consciousness. We must now organize and relate to ourselves as a nation of people. When we look at our relationship, we say to the Koreans as a nation, we see the same relationship that Japan has to America as a nation. You notice that they are bargaining right now, negotiating, right? Japan is building up its resources. It is blocking out US industry from its nation, yet it is entering into the American markets and selling there and taking out the wealth of the American markets. If we look at our relationship to Koreans, to Dominicans, to other groups, we'll see the same relationship where those groups can enter into the African American nation, set up shop, ship out its wealth day by day and night by night, and yet the African American entrepreneurial nation is not permitted to set up shop in their midst is not permitted to carry wealth from their, from their nations. And they then grow fat on the surplus that they gain from the African American nation. This means then that if we think of ourselves as a nation, we must protect our internal markets from the intrusion of outsiders. We must not permit them entry into our nation. As I look and I see down the 125th streets. Yes. And look at our people locked outside there in the outside. And some people claim that they are protesting this kind of thing. I agree with our vendors there that if black men and black women cannot make a living on that street, 
then no other people should be permitted to make a living on that street. We are not obligated in any kind of way to feed the, the children of other people before we feed our own. But it's only if you think in terms of nationhood that you can resolve this kind of problem. We have tremendous possibilities as a black nation that we don't know where. You can see these white boys over there pursuing China, don't you? Right? They're over to China knocking over each other to get to it. What is the China market worth? to the European. You know what the China market is worth to the European? $500 billion at this point. Do you know what the black market is worth to the European here in America? $400 billion. Our market is as much worth as much as the Chinese market, the Mexican market, which they've drawn up to, to bring in NAFTA. It is worth as much and is worth more than the market of Canada. You know? We are not able to place conditions on their entry into our markets by saying if you enter here, you are going to pay taxes. If you enter here, you are going to leave something here. If you enter here, you're going to leave money in the institutions. You're going to contribute to our schools. You're going to contribute to our recreational centers. You're going to contribute to the employment of our people and to the stability of our families. Right. If you cannot contribute to these things, if you cannot create jobs, right. if you cannot contribute to the education of our people, then we cannot permit you to operate within our borders. This is the way a nation runs. You don't let another people walk in and have their way and walk out and leave you impoverished as a people in the name of a free market. There's no such thing as a free market. Yeah. That's white folks propaganda. Free and open market. No free market. They force people into that market. Castro was not free to say I don't want to be a part of it. When he said, I don't want to be a part of it, they did what? Embargoed him and locked him out. The, China, the Japanese in the early uh, part of the century said, we don't want to be a part of your market. What did the United States do? Sent Admiral Perry in there and blasted those markets open. What free markets do you have there? There are no such things as free markets. And when you learn that, you're going you, you, to be the better for it. And we got the markets, but we are not taking advantage of them. We have gotten ourselves in a situation where we are locked out of other people's markets and we permit them into our own such that we are locked out of our own market. And then we wonder why we suffer the way we do. It is not because we are poor. If we were that poor and impoverished, then why do those people come to us to earn their living and their wealth? It means then we must be a wealthy people. I was looking over here at a recent report. You see, we have as a people everything that it needs to make a nation. We have telephones, fax machines, computers, highways, bridges, riverways, waterways, trucks, everything that many nations in the world, in fact, the vast majority of nations in the world wish that they had available to them what the African-American nation has available to it. They wish they had the highways. They wish they had the trucks. They wish they had the trains. They wish they had the ships. They wish they had the computers, the telephones, and all of those kinds of things that you can just pick up and dial right away. And they don't have to be rooted through France or somewhere else. The lights don't go off at 2 o'clock every day or just flip on and off. You got it all here. Then why then are we not better off than we are? Because it is not enough, as I told you earlier, it is not enough to have gold in your soil, or oil in your soil, or diamonds in your soil. You must have a consciousness. It is only with an appropriate consciousness that these things can be transformed and converted into what? Wealth and power, and can be used for the advancement of a people and the survival of a people. The same is true here then. 
You cannot just have telephones and taxes and this and that and not just have money in your pocket. That's not enough. You must have a consciousness that transforms those phones and transforms those faxes into a communications network that unites a people across regions and places and cities and becomes a basis for a system of distribution, a basis for uniting and creating a market from which one earns wealth to feed one's family and to stabilize one's social situation. But you can have all of these things, but if you don't have a sense of nation, if you don't have a group consciousness, if you do not identify yourself as a nation, then these are but so many instruments and becomes, as a matter of fact, the means by which we destroy ourselves. We're looking at the black, uh, black buying power in America here, 1990 to 95. We got a report here called the Georgia Business and Economic Conditions, published here by the Selick Center at the University of Georgia, titled Black Buying Power by Place of Residence, 1990 uh, to 95. The second of a two-part analysis of buying power in specific markets. What are we talking about here? Is this published for us? No. No. What it's published for is for white folk. Right. And it's telling them how much money black folk got. Right. And it's telling them that the, black, the money black folk got is the difference between their success and their failure. It reads in part here, Georgia's African-American uh, population thus controls approximately 16 cents of each dollar in spending power. That is about one dollar. Uh, that is about one dollar in six is spent by black consumers. How aware are we of the kind of power right. we have as African people? Right. Clearly, they are a substantial economic force throughout the state. Uh. All right. But without a national consciousness, you don't recognize that. Right but they recognize it. They go on to say, for many of Georgia's businesses, the ability to capture black spending can make the difference between success and failure. They're putting it right in your face. If black spending power, if black spending can make the difference between the success and failure of Georgia businesses, and we're talking about what? white folks businesses that means black folk got what power because power is about what the ability to succeed or to bring about what failure and when somebody else's success or failure depends on your own behavior then you have what power new york state the largest black market in the world the largest black market in the world and the largest black market in this country. How much money are we worth? We are not able to place conditions on their entry into our markets by saying, if you enter here, you are going to pay taxes. If you enter here, you are going to leave something here. If you enter here, you are going to leave money in the institutions. You are going to contribute to our schools. You are going to contribute to our recreational centers. You are going to contribute to the employment of our people and to the stability of our families. If you cannot contribute to these things, if you cannot create jobs, if you cannot contribute to the education of our people, then we cannot permit you to operate within our borders. This is the way a nation runs. You don't let another people walk in and have their way and walk out and leave you impoverished as a people in the name of a free market. There's no such thing as a free market. Yeah, that's white folks' propaganda. 
free and open market. No free market. They forced people into their market. Castro was not free to say, I don't want to be a part of it. When he said, I don't want to be a part of it, they did what? Embargoed him and locked him out. The, China, the Japanese in the early uh, part of the century said, we don't want to be a part of your market. What did the United States do? Sent Admiral Perry in there and blasted those markets open. What free markets do you have there? There are no such things as free markets. And when you learn that, you're going you, you, you're to be the better for it. And we got the markets, but we are not taking advantage of them. We have gotten ourselves in a situation where we are locked out of other people's markets, and we permit them into our own, such that we are locked out of our own market. And then we wonder why we suffer the way we do. It is not because we are poor. If we were that poor and impoverished, then why do those people come to us to earn their living and their wealth? It means then we must be a wealthy people. I was looking over here at a recent report. You see, we have as a people everything that it needs to make a nation. We have telephones, fax machines, computers, highways, bridges, riverways, waterways, Trucks, everything that many nations in the world, in fact, the vast majority of nations in the world, wish that they had available to them what the African-American nation has available to it. They wish they had the highways. They wish they had the trucks. They wish they had the trains. They wish they had the ships. They wish they had the computers, the telephones, and all of those kinds of things that you can just pick up and dial right away, and they don't have to be rooted through France or somewhere else. The lights don't go off at 2 o'clock every day or just flip on and off. You got it all here. Then why then are we not better off than we are? All right. Because it is not enough. As I told you earlier, it is not enough to have gold in your soil or oil in your soil or diamonds in your soil. You must have a consciousness. It is only with an appropriate consciousness that these things can be transformed and converted into what? wealth and power and can be used for the advancement of a people and the survival of a people. The same is true here then. You cannot just have telephones and faxes and this and that and not just have money in your pocket. That's not enough. You must have a consciousness that transforms those phones and transforms those faxes into a communications network that unites a people across regions and places and cities and becomes a basis for a system of distribution, a basis for uniting and creating a market from which one earns wealth to feed one's family and to stabilize one's social situation. But you can have all of these things, but if you don't have a sense of nation, if you don't have a group consciousness, if you do not identify yourself as a nation, then these are but so many instruments and becomes, as a matter of fact, the means by which we destroy ourselves. We are looking at the black, uh, black buying power in America here, 1990 to 95. We got a report here called the Georgia Business and Economic Conditions, published here by the Selick Center at the University of Georgia, titled Black Buying Power by place of residence, 1990 uh, to 95. The second of a two-part analysis of buying power in specific markets. What are we talking about here? Is this published for us? No. no. What it's published for is for white folk. Right. And it's telling them how much money black folk got. Right. And it's telling them that the, black, the money black folk got is the difference between their success, and their failure. It reads in part here, Georgia's African-American uh, population thus controls approximately 16 cents of each dollar in spending power. That is about one dollar, uh, that is about one dollar in six is spent by black consumers. How aware are we of the kind of power we have as African people? Clearly, they are a substantial economic force throughout the state. Uh, all right. 
But without a nation of consciousness, you don't recognize that. But they recognize it. They go on to say, for many of Georgia's businesses, the ability to capture black spending can make the difference between success and failure. They're putting it right in your face. If black spending power, if black spending can make the difference between the success and failure of Georgia businesses, and we're talking about what? White folks' businesses. That means black folk got what? Power. Because power is about what? The ability to succeed or to bring about what? Failure. And when somebody else's success or failure depends on your own behavior, then you have what? Power. New York State, the largest black market in the world, the largest black market in the world and the largest black market in this country. How much money are we worth in New York State, black people? You know how much money we are worth? $61 billion. That is a lot of money. This represents well over 10% of the buying power in New York State alone. I'm speaking of the, the, the area, the New York, Connecticut, tri-state area. And uh, what does that mean? Now, but don't look at that absolute figure. Look at what would happen if we reinvested that $60 billion. If we put that $60 billion in black businesses, in black trade, if we invested that $60 billion in gaining equity in the major American corporations, if we gain that, use that $60 billion to gain equity in African countries. You know, I was just reading a piece this week about the fact that black investment bankers, a couple of black investment bankers are selling as much as $100 million dollars of bonds for the, the African uh, Development Bank. Yes, another black investment banker is selling something like $500 million of securities for African businesses and infrastructural development. What does that mean, African people? That means that if we were knowledgeable of corporate finance, if we were knowledgeable of investment vehicles, we could literally finance the development of Africa. And by buying securities in the African Development Bank, by buying bonds, by buying other investment instruments in African corporations, even if they're owned by white folk, because once we buy the shares, we become the owners. In other words, then, by using black wealth, we can become the vehicle for financing African growth and development. And by, by using our own wealth, and financing our own businesses, developing our own economic system, we would multiply our wealth, and we would not only be then worth 400 billion, we'd be worth uh, 800 billion or more, and we would go stronger. And the stronger we go, grow, the more others would depend upon how we spend in order to survive, and to that degree, we will gain power over them. If tomorrow we decided as African people to build co-op supermarkets across this country, and we can do it, so that we can sell our people grocery and food at below wholesale prices. If we decided using our church organizations as a means for sponsoring these co-op our food markets across the country so that we can open them literally simultaneously and centered then the buying uh, power for all of those co-op centers in a way that then we would have billions of dollars to spend with the suppliers of food. We could then manipulate those producers in terms of the buying power that we have. We can begin then to place our people on their boards we can begin then to have real and substantial power in America. We have it in our hands, but you got to think of it as nation. It becomes interesting, by the way, if you study this particular breakdown of black spending in Georgia, and I wish we would get these breakdowns across the country. You see, 
When you become a state and a nation, you develop statistics. You see, and that's where statistics come from. It is the means by which a state and a nation gathers information about itself so that it can use that information to reorganize itself and to set itself up in ways to advance its interests. So once you become a nation, you become sensitive to the fact that you need a lot of information so that you can use this information. Now, when I read about the percentage of black buying power, in Georgia, by counties, something becomes very surprising. You note, for instance, that black buying power is as high as 25 and 26 percent in many of these counties. For instance, in Liberty County, Georgia, black buying power there uh, is, a, is 22 percent of the total buying power. In, Mer uh, in Merck Weather, 25 percent. Peach County, 25 percent. Uh, and you can just go on and on. In some of these counties, black buying power is as much as 45%, 35%. In other words, the black consumer has these counties by the balls. And they are able, if that buying power was to be coordinated and used, to have real impact and to transform the power relations of those societies and of those counties. They would be able, if they are buying half or 25% or 30% of what is being bought in those counties to establish their own businesses and enterprises there. And they would be able to defend those businesses and enterprises through the use of the boycott weapon. So what are we saying here then this evening, ladies and gentlemen? That African power is based on an African consciousness based on an African-centered culture, based on an African-centered personality. And the degree to which our personalities and our culture are based on African values, based on African interests, based on African goals, to that degree we empower ourselves as Africans, and to that degree we escape the power of others over us. Thank you very much for your guidance.